um, when I got here, they told me I was speaking on migrants on both sides of the border, which is just fine. I can do either one, but it, it's been uh, rather um, a, 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 an abrupt shift. So just just so you're aware. So um, the reason we have migrants on both sides of the border is primarily because of NAFTA, and I'll give you some information. The political climate that gave rise to NAFTA, which is basically the neoliberal economy, economic system, and we'll talk about these uh, acronyms, and then we'll talk about agricultural exceptionalism, which is the key um, the key uh, part of most labor laws that keep farm workers and immigrants on this side of the border trapped and unable to improve their lives, essentially. And then we'll talk about what's happened to the Mexican farming culture, which in my mind is very sad, and what we need to do next. So those are the questions we can look at. And the area that I personally studied in my work was West Central Mexico, the countryside. But since then, I go to Mexico, I try to go at least once a year and most often every six months to see what's happening in the countryside so I can keep track of it. And we, since we have such a huge Oaxacan farm worker population in the Watsonville area, we're including Oaxaca. And what I'm told in Oaxaca is the same process existed throughout the countryside with NAFTA. And so um, just to introduce you to farm families, uh, this is a family in a nearby a Pueblo or a rancho, they're called, or a village, right near the town of Cuquillo, Jalisco. And so if you were to walk up a dirt road and start meeting the families, this is kind of a, a portrait of the scene you might see. And this is um, the family of Rosario Morales here. And this is another family in Las Cebollas, which is uh, located in Michoacan. And <coughs> this is Jovita Tejada and her family in her corn, bean, and squash intercrop. And this is a key element in the survival of Mexican farmers. Hello. Hi. Um, through, are you in the right place? Yeah, because we're speaking after you. Oh, OK. So well, we're here anyway. put, put a flag up when it's time for me to come to a conclusion, OK? Sure. Yeah, because I, once I get going, I, <laughs> there's, there's no end. Um, welcome. Good morning. Are you, Good are you, or afternoon, are you in, in the right place as well? Or? I believe so. This is the third planet from the. <laughs> <laughs> They the told me that I was arriving Yeah, the satellite just <laughs> landed. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, I want to say a little bit about the corn, bean, and squash intercrop. Uh, at least in West Central Mexico, where I did most of my research for my doctorate, um, they there were three crops: corn, bean, and squash that were planted, we think, together for at least 7,000, maybe up to 9,000 years. And during the process, these three plants have mut symbiotic mutualistic relationships where they benefit one another. And farmers universally told me that before hybrid corn came from the United States into Mexico, there were no problems with pests at all that, and now there's been a lot of scientific study of the corn, bean, and squash intercrop, and we now know that each of those crops supports and benefits the existence of the other plants. So for, as an example, the uh, beans are nitrogen fixing, they pr essentially produce fertilizer, they have direct root connections with the corn, pump nitrates directly into the corn plant so that the production of corn is greatly increased beyond what you would get in a monoculture. And the squash, when they grow, they have wide leaves that shelter the ground 
and the sun can't penetrate and that retards the, the, the weeds. So once this system is set up, the farmers really have very little to do. Because they don't even have to water it, uh, simply because it, it's, it was a rain-fed uh, production system. So this is the corn, bean, squash intercrop that supported many, many generations of Mexicans for thousands of years. And this is, uh, you can see here the three plants growing together. There's the corn stalk, the beans use the corn for support, direct root connection with, with the uh, corn, and then the squash in the background with the wide leaves. And I personally, when I visit the countryside in Mexico, uh, the, the vistas are just magnificent, and it's hard to see clearly here with this background, but if you were standing in Jovita Tejada's uh, corn bean squash intercrop, the, the, the surrounding countryside is just breathtakingly beautiful. And then in November, typically, was the time of the harvest, and uh, they, the, 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 the um, campesinos put these baskets on their back, go through and they vary adeptly. I mean, I tried it and I'm not nearly <laughs> as proficient, but they rip off the corn sheaves and throw the hardened corn into these baskets. And the reason why I have this picture is so you can see the genetic diversity. Now, as a biologist, this is key because what happened is during those 7,000 to 9,000 years, uh, the, the corn was hand-selected at the end of each season. So every farmer would choose what they described as the most beautiful and biggest corn uh, cobs, and they would save that for next year to plant. And so they did this year after year for thousands of years, and what we ended up with was genetic strains of corn that perfect, perfectly matched the diverse environments of Mexico. Mexico has everything from seashores to deserts to high mountains to jungles. There's everything. And so uh, Mexico became the corn repository for genetics for the whole world. There's three crops that support all of humanity, right? Rice, wheat, and corn. And Mexico was the corn repository for genetics. What that means is that if somebody, for instance, in Vietnam, they had a crisis with corn, they bring their plant over, they found, find an environment that's similar to what they're growing it in in uh, Vietnam, and the plant in Mexico most likely is resistant. They do a cross, they start a whole new strain, and that solves the problem. The U.S. did this with the southern uh, corn blight in the 1970s. So maintaining this genetic diversity is key, is absolutely key to human well-being on the planet. And then at the end of the season, uh, the, the cost of renting that hillside since almost all of the campesinos rent, there, there are some that own the land, but a lot of them rent, and the, the, the uh, price they pay is allowing the grower or the owner to bring their livestock in and eat the crop residues. So that's the whole cycle. They also fertilize too, huh? Yes, they fertilize. In fact, we did a study on the um, soil content, the soil nutrients outside of the inner crop and then inside. And inside, it's so much. That's why they don't have to use fertilizer. It actually maintains itself. It's a very efficient, organic, sustainable system. And here you can see the natural environment, the native environment, reclaiming the space over time. So they would plant in one place for two years, and then they would let it lie fallow and, as they describe it, rest for five years. So the native vegetation could reclaim it, and they would find another place. It's called Swidden agriculture. And you can see then there's no ecological damage whatsoever. So it's a very efficient, sustainable, ecologically supportive system. 
Okay, now, here is the key that leads to the migrants on both sides of the border. Now, uh, the U.S. became dominant in corn production, not genetically diverse, mostly homogenized genetically forms of corn uh, in the late 1980s, early 90s. And they wanted to get their corn into Mexico, where it's a predominant grain that's sold to people. Um, so they couldn't because Mexico protected its small farmers, like the one you just saw with Jovita Tejada. They had strict tariffs at the border. So prior to NAFTA, if you were a farmer in Idaho, and you wanted to sell corn in Mexico, you'd load up your truck with corn, go to the border, and there'd be a border guard that would say that would be $300 tariff. And you'd do the math in your head, realize you couldn't make a profit, and you'd stay in the U.S. And that protected these small farmers. Now, I should mention that these farmers often sold a third to a half of their crop to the government at government outpost systems, and that was used in very reduced cost food stores called conosupos to mitigate poverty. So anybody that couldn't buy food at the normal price could come to a conosupo and buy it much cheaper. And that's how the government uh, mitigated poverty. So it was a really efficient system. However, the North American Free Trade Agreement came in and free, the free and free trade refers to getting rid of all uh, tariffs at the border. And so uh, the people that drafted NAFTA uh, really fed the world a bill of goods. They said if we have NAFTA, it's going to equalize wages on both sides of the border, uh, prices in Mexico will go up, Everybody will be employed, so there won't be any immigration to the U.S. I mean, if you want to read my book, you can read about all the promises that were given. Environmental protection. Environmental, all, all oh, the whole, you name it, it was there. It sounded wonderful, right? What's the name of your book? Uh, the Farm Worker's Journey. Yeah, The Farm Worker's Journey. And um, so, the, the, basically, no one knows <clears throat> I researched this for many years. No one knows who was on the committee that drafted NAFTA. However, we suspect it must have been a group of business people because they decided that the Mexican corn production I just mentioned was inefficient. And since the U.S. is the largest corn producer, we are efficient. We should supply all of Mexico with its corn. So that was that was the basis <coughs> for NAFTA. And what we need to do, according to the NAFTA, is get rid of the tariffs to protect the small farmers. And we need to start a free flow of exchange of goods, capital or money, and information. But there was never any recognition of what would happen to laborers who might want to go back and forth. So that was never written into the NAFTA agreement because it was considered so controversial that it might trump the entire agreement itself. So this was NAFTA. <clears throat> and these, uh, what happened with NAFTA is there was supposed to be a 15, let's see, how many, how many years? 15-year phase-out period, that was it. 15-year phase-out period of the tariffs. So they weren't going to happen abruptly, and that would allow the, the, the rural farmers to find alternative employment. So the first year, the tariffs would hardly go down at all. <clears throat> the next year, they go down more, and they go down more and more until by 2009, since NAFTA went into effect in 94. By 2009, there would be free trade, no tariffs. Okay, what happened instead was all the tariffs were eliminated within 30 months. And I was down interviewing farmers during this period of time, and it was absolute chaos in the countryside. They had no idea what had happened. 
The only thing they knew was that the price of their corn that they used to get from the government at the government outpost had been cut in half, that they could not support their families, that they were at risk of starvation, and everybody, they told me a, a gallon of gas, now it costs twice what it did before NAFTA. And so there was absolute uh, chaos in the countryside. And uh, there was no, I asked them, I said, do you know why this has happened? No, it's probably a problem with the government and, and so on. So these families then, looked at their options and they realized that, that growing corn was no longer productive. Meanwhile, the United States was dumping tons and tons and tons of corn into Mexico. It was infiltrating the, uh, the entire population and the countryside. Uh, some people planted the corn from the U.S., which then contaminated the pure genetic strains that had been hand-selected for thousands of years, um, and basically we were losing all of that genetic diversity. It's very Is sad. U.S. corn subsidized too? Yes, and the U.S. Thank you. And the U.S. Plus GMO, right? Yeah, yeah. The U.S. corn has been always been subsidized. Mexican corn is not subsidized, absolutely, and. Much of the corn that's been shipped to Mexico is G GMO. Mexicans don't like our corn. They said it's not nutritious and it doesn't, it doesn't taste right and, and on and on. They're not happy with it, but there it is. And if you go to the marketplace, that's about all there is to buy these days, unfortunately. So farmers in Mexico were left with three choices. One, they could stay with their families on their farms in Mexico and starve. And some of them, I talked to people who, who made that choice. They said, we've lived here for generations, we're not leaving. So, I mean, it was very sad. Two is go to a big city and look for work there and send money home to support the family. And if you go up in a plane over Mexico City now, which is one of the biggest cities on the planet, it is literally ringed by shanty towns, so, so many that you can't see the edge of the city. It's quite a phenomenon. Uh, usually when you go up in a plane, you can see where the city ends and the countryside begins or something, some natural environment. But you can go up in a plane today in Mexico City and not see anything but the city. It's, it's amazing because it's ringed with shanty town of these displaced workers. And then finally, the other option is to make an undocumented border crossing to the United States, hope you survive, and uh, work in agriculture or construction mostly, and then send money home to your family. So prior to NAFTA, we had about 4.5 million undocumented people in Mexico. Salinas de Gotari, who was the president and supported NAFTA at this time, estimated that a million farmers would leave their land every year for the first 15 years of NAFTA. Where did he expect them to go? What a thing for a president to sign on to, right? And so today, we have 11.5 million undocumented people here. And if you notice, uh, in the current administration, they're demonized, they're hated, their children are kidnapped. I mean, all the horrors imaginable uh, go to these people. And it's like uh, I was uh, on an interview with Dennis Bernstein on KPFA a, a week and a half or so ago. And like I said, you know, the U.S. gets into these Latin American countries. We intervene and disrupt their economy. And then when the fallout appears in the form of refugees at our border, we blame them, we bl demonize them, we don't take any responsibility for their well-being. In fact, quite the contrary. In fact, two or three days ago, I was very sad because I understand that an 18-month-old baby that was kidnapped died in a detention center. I mean, this is, this is, what have we become? This is horrible. Yes? Since Trump's tariffs, though, more and more farmers in California are being forced to 
move their farms to northern Mexico where the labor is because there's not enough labor to support them here. Well, who would want to stay here? You know, I work with farm workers yeah, almost every day. They grow their food in northern Mexico. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's a paradox, right? But I, I cannot stand, every time I visit the farm worker community and we sit down and have chats and so on, everybody lives in constant terror of, be, of de being deported and not only that, I recently wrote an article of five ways that the system has of tearing apart farm or farm worker families. So it's, I've never, there's never been an ethnic group that's been so assaulted, their family structure, as the farm workers other than in the rural south during the time of slavery when people were sold. But other than that, I've never heard of any other ethnic group uh, family structure being assaulted in this way. Yes. Native Americans. Native Americans. Na Native Americans, that's true. Their kids are sent off to these ridiculous schools. Yeah. Well, Juan Gonzalez of uh, Democracy Now um, in his book, um, Harvest of Empire, went through um, yeah. documenting a lot of that, in fact. Right, right. About, you know, how um, our policies <coughs> in Mexico and <coughs> Latin America have caused migration. And then, <coughs> who were discriminating against on the borders? And then you look at the other people that are coming into the United States. It's all the places <coughs> that we've been bombing. So. Yeah, it, there it is. We intervene. People have to leave. They come to our country hoping for asylum or hoping for some remediation <coughs> from our uh, trade policies like NAFTA. And what do we do? Demonize them, throw them in jail, kill their kids, whatever. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, do you see the H-2A being the same as the Bracetto program? And a lot of people don't think that that's still going on. There's a lot of parallels. Oh, yeah, we have it in uh, Watsonville. Right, yeah, H2A. Whole groups. Yeah. But um, what are the main differences? And do you, <laughs> how, how is that? How is the H-2A program now? Different from the Brissetto program. Oh, <clears throat> well, I think there's there's incredible parallels. I think the main difference is that the farmer who hires them has to provide them with housing. But uh, what I've heard is a lot of abuse, in, in the sense that uh, they will they will go down to the border, collect these uh, these campesinos, put them in a big truck, come put them in a house that they've rented and tell them they can only go stay in the house or go to the field. They can't go anywhere else. So essentially they hold them in bondage or slavery that way. So there's a lot of abuse and I don't know enough about the history of the Brocero system to know whether that kind of, but I mean it's pretty rampant in the farming communities I visit. When the Bracero movement started, when it first became law, they, the majority of Mexicans that came up worked, took their very valuable dollars and went back to their homes yep. and spent them for the rest of the year and just came up for the harvest. That, right. And that was the idea, was that our dollar was so much more valuable. And that was when they the, would much prefer to live in Mexico. It's absolutely. Down, down at some point. And also another thing that's important is the kind of DAT that was outlawed here in the 60s was sent down to the northern Mexico farms, which provide most of the fruits and vegetables for America during the winter especially. The and DDT, or you say DDT? Yeah, DDT and other chemicals. Oh, the chemical situation is horrific. Are used currently down in <coughs> Mexico and yeah. the fruit and vegetables are shipped <coughs> It's like one municipal president told me in Cuquillo, we can always count on the United States to send us the worst of everything. That's the reputation. And I don't like that. I, I don't feel good about that at all. Yes. Excuse me. Uh, all due respect to everybody here and yourself, um, is that our understanding because we have Carmen Mata from San Quintin, Baja California, mm -hmm. who can be presenters here. Uh, appreciate you know what you said, very interesting, important. I just have one comment on, on the whole question of the Bracero program mm -hmm. versus the H H2A or whatever yeah. and the Kisswalker program. And I can tell you that on my experience in the 50 years and up to now, there's been no change. Yep. All they did was change the beautiful name of you're a guest worker. Okay? Yep. And that means that the system goes on. Yeah. Nothing's changed about a controlled 
workforce. Right. The Mexican government, the ICE and Immigration Center here at the federal level, and being handed over to the growers yep. for exploitation. And what it is is control of the workforce. Yeah. And exploitation of the workforce and keeping it down <coughs> where if they say anything about conditions, Santa Maria, yeah. just this last year, <coughs> they housed them in a ho re renovated hotel. There was no kitchen but given hot plates for each of the rooms. Yeah. Which is basically a what we call fire hazard. Well, it's okay. true. It, I mean, beyond the programs, this is what I see daily among people that are not in any program but work in agriculture. Sixteen people living in less than a thousand square feet, one bathroom, and children. I mean, it's it's disgraceful. The, the, the only answer to that is the remodify and uh, reform that system where people come yeah. here are free to move their transit into other jobs yes. in the community, and they're yes. not. And the bottom line, it's made for that, indemnity. that. Yeah. The North American Free Trade Agreement is being uh, uh, negotiated. We, the consumers, are not there. The unions are not there. The farm there? workers are no. not there. The farm workers are not there. Who's there? The corporations. Yep. And if you the corporations it. have you know, caused the kind of problems we're having with the environment and the climate and everything we're That's having, right. it's, it's all connected yeah. to the poisons. They profit from the neoliberal economy, which is privatize, deregulate, get rid of public services, and if anyone's too poor to be successful, it's their own fault, and you blame them. If you if you listen, that's that's the economy we're in. It's a very undemocratic system. Getting back to my second part. Oh, me. go go is, ahead. Is there going to be an opportunity? Is that I was told that she was going to be a presenter yeah. uh, in, in this uh, session. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm the presenter, supposedly. Well, I mean, would you like to present instead? It's fine with me. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that that she'd have an opportunity to speak uh, in the session. Yeah, no. This I was told no, this she is, is a session. Listed. I think she's listed. Yeah, I'm listed. Well, they're in the wrong. But she is also yeah. listed for, uh, for NAFTA. She's, in fact, she's first. Uh, there's two names on there currently. Did you have you? a question? No. Yeah, I did because um, I, I was under the impression that um, Mexicans have, have risen up against exploitation by Monsanto and have um, gotten rid of the, uh, I've gotten rid of the corporate corn because of the, of the yes. way it was. Okay. Yes. So, some of the things you said yep. led me to believe that we were still in the old paradigm. Well, what we are, I mean, it's, it's both, really, because on in 2013, a federal judge in Mexico outlawed the sale of any more uh, foreign corn, GMO, hybrid, whatever, as a, quote, imminent threat to the environment. However, it had been sold since 1995 on many years, so the contamination persists. So now what we have, yes, that's true. You can't, you can no longer sell the corn, but my agronomist in Kukio tells me they do anyway. And all the associated chemicals that go to growing it. And the children where I grow, the last trip I take, and I've been taking at least yearly trips now for 20 years, the children in the high mountains are now getting cancer. I mean, it's really, it's very distressing what's happened. And again, no responsibility. Who's going to pay for the treatments? They, these campesinos don't have money. Yeah. Perhaps, uh, perhaps if you would be willing, you could give her some of your time to present. Uh, if she was under, and her name is on there, and she was under the impression. She is listed. Look, look, look at her name. No, I, I know. I'm both listed. <clears throat> Perhaps you would. Oh, be. yes, go ahead. Where is she? Carmen, you're Manta. Both, you're both listed. So, yeah, go but ahead. But both of you are listed. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I finished with that. So she's Here's saying, four. She's saying go ahead and no, finish. That. No, pero yo puedo compartirlo contigo. Está bien. Este, están ya listo para cruzar la frontera. Sí, y tú puedes ya hablar de lo que pasa cuando llegue. So I'm wondering how much uh, migrant labor would we need if we go to uh, decentralized 
you know, small uh, holdings, that, that there might be some um, uh, extra farm labor uh, during harvest time for certain, you know, seasonal crops. So then if you have diversified um, yeah. uh, organic agriculture, Agro you wouldn't be having a whole lot of things, you know, becoming mature at one time. And so, um, uh, is this you know, migrant labor a symptom of industrial agriculture? It's just a question. It is. Else. It is. It's a hierarchical system, also, I think. Yeah, okay, this man had his hand up. Go ahead. Carmen and Ben. Ben a lot of stuff in. <laughs> I just want to like make with your question. Mm -hmm. Give you an example. When we talk about the farmers saying we need those workers from over there, we can't do it without them. Yeah. And we're saying wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need yeah. the whole issue is about decent wages being paid for the work being done. Right. right. If you can pay a labor under mm -hmm. union contract, mm -hmm. a scrapper who picks up wood, with cutting from the carpenter, being paid twenty dollars an hour. Yeah versus a farm worker who produces food, mm -hmm. okay? There's no difference. Yeah. The difference is wages and working yeah. conditions. If they were paying that much, as when I was a farm worker mm -hmm. and organizing for the United Farm Workers Union, mm -hmm. back in those days in Napa, we never had college students working in the fields. Yeah. But they, I would ask them, why are you here now? He says, because the wages and the conditions are great and we can survive <laughs> and we can work here in the fields. So the difference is there's no difference. There'll be people who are being paid a decent wage. There's enough workers already and unemployed in San Joaquin Valley. That's all I'm trying to address. The issue is wages in Mexico too. And she'll tell you on her own about why she doesn't want to come to this country. Thank you, sorry. No, that's going to translate for her. Yeah, you're, you're you can translate, you want to translate? No, no, not me. I, I mean, you guys. Go are, ahead. You, you, yeah. You, the, I, I, I don't know the car. You can help me too, okay? Con mucho gusto. Okay. 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 Pásale. En, en corto, pedacitos. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Carmen Mata. Vengo de San Quintín, Baja California. Good afternoon. Uh, can somebody record this for, for me on live? Sure. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Good afternoon, I'm uh, Macarno Mata from San Quintín, Baja California. Soy jornalera desde mis ocho años de edad. I've been a farm worker since eight years old from Oaxaca. Conozco, conozco muy bien lo que es la agricultura. I recognize really well what agriculture is all about. Desde la preparación de la tierra hasta la cosecha. In preparing the, the, the soil to the actual harvest. En el 2015 nosotros empezamos la lucha. Since 2015, March 17, we started our struggle in para Baja California. Para defender los derechos de todas las jornaleras y de todos los jornaleros. To defend the rights of women and men working as farm workers in the fields. Han pasado cuatro años en esta lucha. It's been four years in our struggle in Baja California and San Quintín. Hasta el día de hoy no hemos obtenido gran ganancia. Up to today, we haven't received anything that's called a real, which worth a, a good salary. Los tres niveles de gobierno no han, no han querido escuchar ni respetar nuestros derechos. The three levels of government at the federal level have not respected the rights of workers or the benefits that should be paid. Empezamos con 17 puntos. We started with 16 points in our demands. Que le exigimos al gobierno que se respete. That the government should respect. Estos puntos es que nosotros los jornaleros tengamos un mejor salario. And that's what we should have a decent wage. That's what the work stoppage of 80,000 workers was about, March 17th, uh, 2015. Porque, porque por más de 13 horas de jornada, more of 13 hours per day, nosotros ganamos entre 7, 8 dólares por, por día. For those hours, we earn 7 to 8 dollars uh, uh, for those hours uh, harvesting uh, crops. No estamos afiliados al Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social. They don't register us into the, what we call Social Security Insti Institute that provides health care for us. No tenemos prestaciones. We don't have the kinds of uh, working conditions uh, that uh, abide to our health and care. No tenemos aguinaldo. We don't have the surplus funds to be able to say we're accredited for that benefit. 
Nuestras mujeres embarazadas no descansan antes ni después del parto. The women who are pregnant in the fields before and after don't have leaves in order to be able to survive. Y la misma necesidad que hay de dinero. And the same thing goes for the money that we earn. Las hace trabajar hasta casi el día del parto. They force us to work unless we don't work, we're fired up to the very day that we have the baby. Muchas son madres solteras. Many are women that are, that are unmarried. Muchas cuentan con un esposo. Some with a husband. Pero también tienen más hijos. But they have many children. Eh, muchos niños no tienen derecho a la educación. They don't have the children any right to a real la, education. La canasta básica es muy alta. The, what you call the bread basket, the survive, is extremely high. No tenemos una vivienda digna. We don't have a decent home. No tenemos un buen salario. We don't have a good salary. Nuestros niños no tienen la educación que deberían de tener. And they don't have a decent education. Tampoco contamos con un sindicato que de Tampoco contábamos con un sindicato que defendiera nuestros derechos. Nor did we have at that time a union that could defend Todos our rights. Todos los que existen son sindicatos charros. All that we have now, after we had this uh, walkout in demand in 2015, was uh, a bunch of company uh, unions that came in, attempting and did say that they represented the workers, which basically were sent in by the government. Aparte de esto, los químicos que usan allá son muy, muy, muy tóxicos. Aside from that, the, the chemicals are very toxic that we're being fumigated and injected into the soil that we breathe, whatever is being injected into the soil. And those poisons affect us. En el mundo hay entre, siete, entre cinco y siete millones de químicos diferentes que nos vienen afectando a los seres humanos. There's thousands and thousands of different types of uh, horrendous uh, chemicals with uh, really strong uh, consequences. Aparte al año se producen 1,500 químicos diferentes para las plantas. But 1,500 types of chemicals are being used in the early stages of the plants and the strawberries uh, that affect us too. Y 1,200 químicos que se van desarrollando nuevos por cada año. And the development of 1,200 types and different types of dangerous chemicals which are cancerous. Es decir que que estos químicos, esas empresas grandes que desarrollan los químicos están matando a los jornaleros de San Quintín. What we're saying basically the development of these strong chemicals al, is the death of the farm workers. A las personas de Estados Unidos mm -hmm. y de todo el país. Not only Mexico but also in this country and other parts of the world. Porque los químicos no solamente se usan allá, sino so también aquí. Chemicals are not just used there, they're used here too. En diferentes cantidades, in different quantities, diferentes porciones, and strengths and pero portions, todas con un solo propósito. All because of one, you know, reason why. Envenenar a nuestra gente y matarla. Uh, poison our faith, our people, and even much more than that. Hasta el día de hoy, up to now, eh, seguimos luchando. We still continue struggling. Contra la empresa Driscolls. Against the corporation that allowed through the NAFTA to cross the border and start farming in San Quintín, five and a half hours from the Mexican border. Que es una empresa que está en San Quintín, pero en Estados Unidos cada vez se hace más grande. That corporation is based out of Watsonville, California. Mm -hmm. And every day it continues to grow in strength. And now they have not only Baja California, they have Nayarit, Jalisco, Michoacán, and Querétaro. Están en, en muchos estados. There are many of the states that I just said. Ellos hacen millonarios. They become millionaires and billionaires. Cuando nosotros no ganamos lo que debemos de ganar. When we don't earn what we have to earn. Aquí en Estados Unidos una, un basquete de fresas se vende entre 8 o 9 dólares el basquete. <coughs> A little basket of strawberries goes between 7 and 8 dollars. And which is basically what we earn in one whole day, 12 hours. A nosotros nos pagan por más de 13 horas de jornada. They basically work us for 13 hours a day maximum. Sin ningún derecho. Without any rights at all. Sin ninguna buena condición. In any working conditions. Sin la esperanza de llegar a la vejez y ser jubilados. And even thinking of maybe ever having to retire. Porque ever. no podemos cotizar las semanas. Because we can't end up accumulating the kind of work hours that they demand in order to qualify 
under the Social Security that they don't have. Que se despedida porque no nos afilia. And they're fired when uh, they, they're going to be able to uh, be counted as part of that uh, Social Security requirement. They fire them before they get to those hours. La tierra es envenenada. The soil is contaminated and poisoned. La capa de ozono cada día se destruye más. The ozone is more. La agua. La capa de ozono. Nuestra agua también es envenenada. Our, the, our water is, is being poisoned. Nos obliga a tener agua salada. They obligate us to drink water that has high concentrations of sodium. Porque las corporaciones ricas. Because the tremendous powerful uh, corporations in Obtienen el agua dulce. They go after the aquifers, and the sweet water run off from the mountains. Nuestra agua no es limpia. Our water is, water is not clean. Nuestra agua es sucia. Our, our water is dirty. Es salada. It's a lot of concentrations of water. Así no, no las están privatizando. And even then, they're privatizing uh, the water. El ejemplo. Me, Mexicali resiste, está luchando contra, contra el Constellation Brands. Right now, Mexicali, there is a beer company. The European U.S. They brought out, you know, Corona and Budweiser, Bud Light, Modelo, and all these. <coughs> this silly population is an outrage as it relates to their privatizing the water and basically the sweet water, and also from the Colorado River, and they're upright because they privatize now the water where the government controls the water, selling this water or giving it away to the Constellation Brands, by the way, they're on boycott too. Un ejemplo. Eh, An example. Ayer llegué aquí a Estados Unidos. Yesterday I arrived here in the U.S. El agua de aquí pues es dulce. The water here seems to be, you know, soft water. Tu pelo queda suave cuando te bañas. Your hair when you wash it, at least, it's a lot different. No, nuestra agua no. And our water isn't. Nuestra agua es salada. It has concentrations of a lot of salt, sodium. Es, es mucho sodio lo que contiene. There's a lot of sodium in you. Los pelos parecen palos. Your hair looks like uh, little uh, toothpicks. <laughs> la, piel, la piel se enferma. Los niños se nos enferman. Our kids What's causing the salt in the water? What's that? What's causing this, this ¿Qué está causando el agua en esto? Esto, esto viene afectando a todos nuestros niños en la salud. Pero ¿qué, está causa? ¿Qué es la causa? ¿Qué es la causa? Las empresas que se están llevando nuestra agua dulce. Es porque las corporaciones están tomando el agua dulce de los aquifers. Y no hay una tubería o infraestructura en estas comunidades. Y estas comunidades en San Quintín, básicamente, las personas que vienen y 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 vienen with uh, which I've observed. Whatever they have can contain tin metal, uh, what you call sticks, cardboard, cardboard yeah, yeah. Uh, plastic, that's their home. So they're living in shanties and they're, they're living in shanties. Where are they getting their water from? Donde están agarrando el agua. La, el, nuestra agua que nos mandan eh, tiene que salir del pozo, pero ahora ya no la sacan del pozo. Ahora la agarran del, del mar. Por eso el agua es salada. Generally speaking, water has been attempted in some cases they reached some water uh -huh. but not to the aquifers uh -huh. and other than that the only other water is from the ocean so what are they irrigating the crops that these people are picking? how are they irrigating the crops that these people are picking? in the plants? yes the rich corporations like Driscoll buy the sweet water to irrigate the cultivars like the fresa La mora, el arándano. What the Driscoll Corporation and other corporations do, they go to the government, federal land, state, and they purchase land where they can find water in those aquifers, and they take control of that water, and the communities get left out. Pero tienen corporaciones que venden el agua. Sí, aparte, aparte es una empresa que se llama Conagua. They have a corporate name of Conagua, or part of the government, that controls that water. Es el agua que no tiene, no es que no tiene. Esta, esta empresa es, también tiene agua dulce, pero también la vende a los ranchos que siembran cultivos y a la gente les meten el agua salada. That corporation has the, the capacity to buy 
these um, areas where they can drill and take water from those aquifers, meaning that it leaves them but out, out of the spectrum and in light of that the people in those communities get left out with no water because there's no infrastructure for they having drilled water. So they buy this water in these uh, areas. Todo es una corrupción. Everything is a corrupt. Y es un asesinato. And it's also about death. Para los trabajadores y también para nuestro planeta Tierra. For us in the soil and for the planet. Por eso este 29 de septiembre tenemos un llamado para ustedes los consumidores. This uh, coming 29th of September, we have a global, uh, let me say, protest or action all over the world, China, Japan, <coughs> Europe, and the U.S. In In 29th of, of September. And I'm asking the farm workers, the consumers here, to join us in having a discussion with the supermarkets and I'll take off a little bit on my own here, by you thing, to help you, is that the strategy is to go to the store and say, we are the consumers, we are the investors, we are the ones that, you know, make you, uh, give you the wealth, but these strawberries here causing the death and the annihilation of our people, and we're asking you to take those berries off and not use another label or another company but not this one in particular or, or another company that maybe uh, that they had on the list for sake that we invest here. And, and not just to give you an idea of what happened when we've gone to Costco or Safeway or uh, whatever, you know, grocery store. They'll say, get out, call security, call the police. Well, we beat, we beat them to the punch when they say that, call the police, but call the manager. And the idea is to draw cons consensus and consciousness on that. And that's basically what she's saying. This call is a call by the Farm Workers Union. I'm not in the Does she have a list of those companies that... Uh, well, let me explain that. You're getting on the list of those, of those ranchos. Understand that Driscoll is huge. Driscoll, okay. Driscoll has a subsidiary Mexican. called Berry Mex. Okay? Oh, yeah. it's, they call it Mexican operation. Doesn't have anything to do uh, uh, with us. Huh. They package, ship, transport, and market, and control the and monopolize. In San Quentin, they buy from all these growers, large, medium, and small. So they control the whole industry of that package, and that package, you know, uh, happens to be very visible in the marketplace. There are some independents that don't go through uh, Driscoll, okay, mm -hmm. but very, very few. And that's what they're doing in the states that I mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. With you, they say they and the empresa tiene control of the mercado por disco. Go ahead. I think somebody else. Uh, well, I, I, I just, I, I have a question because um, I had my hand up way yeah. long ago, <laughs> and um, um, my question is, I I shop where they sell driscolls, and I don't buy it. I haven't bought it for a long time. And people who are around, I tell them about the conditions and, and not to buy it. But, okay, my, but, but my problem is, and I could say this in Spanish, but I'm not going to, because I speak better in English. Um, but, but you know, what? Um, my problem is that, that suppose, now maybe this is not going to ever happen, but suppose they take it off the shelves, all the berries from Driscoll. Then, then what happens, now they maybe could put another name on it, I don't know, but also what also happens to the workers who at least are surviving. Um, I mean, I don't buy it, but if everybody doesn't buy it, if it actually was not put another label on, um, what would happen to your workers there who, who maybe have to be working there? Uh, is, okay, let, let her answer the question if you don't mind, sir. This is a good one to respond to that question. What happens to the workers? In Mexico, in Mexico, no sé dónde exactamente, pero qué va a pasar con los trabajadores sí. cuando no hay trabajo, porque esta compañía está, uh, no está. No. Si nosotros los jornaleros estamos llamando al boicot, es porque nosotros sabemos que este boicot va a tener impacto. Nosotros no nos vamos a quedar sin trabajo. Nosotros tenemos trabajo de sobra. Si esta empresa Driscoll 
se llega a ir de San Quintín, para nosotros va a ser mucho mejor. Pero sabemos que no lo va a hacer, porque ahí tiene su mina de oro, que somos nosotros. Disco no, no va a dejar. Is it, the, we know there's going to be an impact. We know that the workers are going to be somewhat affected. But we know that there's other work too. And because of that sacrifice, we're going to continue with this. Because we know that the bottom line is that, and I think I lost the last part uh, in regards to the último que the heat is. Que no se va a ir. They're not going to go because that's a gold mine with the, the amount of wages and conditions that they're dealing with, that they're not going to leave that. to go back to uh, Watsonville at uh, 10, 10 50 an hour, which is $105 for 10 hours, maybe here. And they're going to leave, you know, I'm just making a comparison of $7 a day or $8 or even $15 a day. Okay, she's basically using that. To, there's no way they're going to leave. En el 2015, cuando nosotros empezamos este movimiento... Estoy hablando de los Estados Unidos ahorita, no, no de México, ¿verdad? Estoy confundido porque yo no sé si está hablando de los trabajadores en México o los trabajadores aquí. No, no, it's no, the same. same. They're, the, same. They're, they're, the only difference is that in México they beat the farm workers, whereas here it's illegal. But everything else, the poverty, so everything. So we're talking mostly right now about here. Yeah, yeah, here too. It's. I listen. Two days ago, I took toilet paper down to the farming commun farm workers community because they had to choose between feeding their children or having toilet paper in the house. That's the kind in of Watsonville? poverty in Watsonville. Sure. Yes. Yeah, but sure. But let me ask, uh, was your, answer, your question answered? Uh, yeah, but I, I really want to know, is that because I've, I've organized other kind of boycott things too, I really want to know what, what they're asking us to do besides asking the, the um, uh, markets to take this off the, are we asking them, uh, the, the markets to see that people aren't suffering, that they let them have a union, that they stop. What do we ask? What are well, I, I successfully got Driscoll's out of my local store. And what I did was downloaded David Bacon's The Great Western America Boycott. And it talks about the boycott that's going on, Driscoll's, from Washington State down to San Quintin. And I took it to the produce manager and I said, I think it's unethical to carry these berries. And not only did he take them off and get berries that were much more delicious and organic from other venues, but he actually typed up a red sheet and hung it in front of the berries with a description of what Driscoll's does. So you might want to look up his article because it's very compelling. Could I just you want to, excuse me, excuse me, can I say something? Could you, I'm sorry, could you give that David name? Bacon, it's, David I'm, Bacon? Bacon, B -A, just look up his website, David Bacon, the Great Western Boycott, I'm Berry I'm Boycott, I'm something I'm like that. You'll, you'll, you'll recognize it, he writes all the oh, time. Ma'am? That's why I'm raising my book. This person has I didn't been raising know. their hand and like, didn't for know. a while back here, and then he's speaking up. Um, she's, she's, she's got something. Uh, she was supposed to be a panelist also. Okay. I'm the next speaker. That's the only reason why I'm okay. speaking up. And, and all oh, I was addressing, okay. well, we I was addressing that you, you had your hand no, up. No, I, I did have my hand up because yeah. I want to know what's the name of the union. How do you call the name of the syndicate? Sindicato Jornaleros. OK. Sobre las sobreviaciones sin hat. No, 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 Give the complete name. Sindicato Independiente de Jornaleros Agrícolas. Agricultural Workers Union. The Independent National Farm Workers Union. Okay. Independent. Okay. Independent. Thank you. National. And just to add, uh, it's a federal registered uh, union with the federal government. In the United States. In Mexico. No, in Mexico. Mexico. Wouldn't dare. She's only, she's only, she's only okay. dealing with Mexico, okay? Not I, here. I'm just okay. checking. No, I'm just trying to clarify. Thank you. Now, we can find it in English if we look at, um, yeah, they've been organized. Well, if you put the, the National 
Farm Workers Independent Union in Mexico, it'll come up. Yeah. It's also I just want to just mention one thing on the, the question you had, ma'am. Uh, uh, in 1968, or 1965, we were involved in our family, many, many families in the strike in Delhi. In 1968, we were forced to go on the boycott for two years, aside from other boycotts. I know. Okay. That question you asked was always <laughs> asked of us, and we said, there's not one farm that we know that's for sale, and it's not going to happen. Okay? Yeah. Because we'd buy the land ourselves if we had a chance to, to get, buy it back. Anyway, uh, there was a question back here. Okay. Una pregunta acá. Sorry. Go ahead. So, con su permisión, no es que preguntar cómo sientes aquí, porque yo estoy mirando algo que pasa muchas veces cuando mujeres o alguien que necesitan hablar no tienen el espacio para hablar. Y otros quieren, oh, con sus comentarios. Y es importante, los tópicos son importantes, pero no más quiero hacer como un suggestion si um, podamos um, continuar um, y los um, comentarios y todo eso, si quieren hablar o decir algo, pueden hacerlo cerrado después. Yo, pues, me gustaría que lo digas en inglés. Um, I was just wanting to, um, I, I asked her if, if she agreed with these sentiments that this, you know, occurs um, many times where um, women, and especially women of color, um, in spaces like these aren't given um, the, the space and the time and the respect that they deserve. And oftentimes we are getting um, off track and um, off to the side conversations, which can honestly be had um, maybe outside or, or to the side and not detract from, from her time, because I think that's um, a lot of um, happening. I just wanted to kind of put that out with her permission, and she said that I'll be able to translate. Sí, voy a ser muy breve. I'm going to pues, be very brief. Es incómodo cuando te dan un espacio de dos minutos o tres minutos, porque no puedes, eh, eh, Para mí, en lo personal, es tan largo el viaje que yo hice de San Quintín para llegar hasta acá sin dinero, dejando a mis hijos, mi trabajo, para que nada más yo llegue hasta aquí y me den tres minutos para hablar. La verdad se me hace así como una falta de respeto para mí, porque yo vengo de tan lejos a este lugar para, para exponer lo que está pasando allá. No porque quiero que me conozcan a mí, no porque quiero tener fama o, o para mí, no, sino es la problemática que está pasando con mis compañeras que son violadas, que son acosadas sexualmente, que no tenemos derecho. Por eso yo vengo hasta acá, para, para hacerles conocer a ustedes lo que con nosotros está pasando, porque yo sé, yo sé lo que aquí en Estados está pasando con ustedes, con el gobernador que tienen, con la gente deportada, con con la gente que cada día está viviendo en la calle porque no pueden pagar sus altas rentas. Entonces, me gustaría que, que hubiera un poquito más de espacio, que no todos nos estemos correteando por el tiempo, la verdad. Sí. I'm going to try. Uh, basically, she says, I feel very uncomfortable. And I just want to tell you that the come that, you know, the all due respect to the presenters, that the time limited for me, for three minutes or four minutes, to come for so far from mm -hmm. so many hours that I don't have the money yeah. to fly to get here, because that's the only way I got here, and not to go back and, you know, only come and represent and give a message which is important, me being here, in regards to the message that we're bringing like other people here, and that this is all important, uh, because uh, we need to speak more to the issue, because many of the workers over there know that I'm here, because through Facebook they know what, what is going on here, and I just want to say that I'm pleased to be here, but in light of that, I think we need to have more time uh, to each of the presenters, so they can all, you know, maybe allow at least what, that kind of thing. Time. Excuse me, but I, I, that's the best I can do in the last year translated. Thank you very much. Thank you.